invite you to welcome with a nice uh, gesture, Mike Engelhardt, the man of the hour and the day. Thank you very much. So I've been writing physical simulators since 1975. And in those decades of writing physical simulators, one thing that I have learned is that the best simulators are not from software companies. They are, without exception, developed by the concern that needs that simulator. And here's some examples that show the normal pattern. Say you need a charged particle optic simulator. That's not a circuit simulator. That's a piece of software that will tell you how uh, an electron or other charged particle beam is uh, focused with the electromagnets and electrodes. Well, if you need a simulator like that, if you need that, you know, that's the sort of thing you'd use if you were designing a cathode ray tube or, say, a linear accelerator for medical purposes or, um, or scanning an electron microscope. Now, if you need that type of software, there's free charge particle optic simulators. It's basically F equals MA, and um, they're kind of fun to write, and um, people write them and give them away. So there's free charge particle optic simulators. Or you can, you can buy them. You can spend, you know, there's a, one that was for sale for $100. Uh, and you can spend up to $100,000 for a charged particle optic simulator. But if you want the very best charged particle optic simulator, it is not for sale and it is not from a software company. It was developed by a scanning electron microscope company and they wrote that simulator explicitly to be a better simulator than was available from anyone at any price. And they wrote it so that they could design better microscopes than their competitors. And that's the business model under which the best simulators are developed in every field of engineering. Here's another example. Say you want a high-speed MOSFET solver. That is a piece of software that will compute the waveforms of an integrated circuit that consists of millions or even billions of MOSFETs. Software like that exists, and you can spend up to a million dollars for a high-speed MOSFET solver. But if you want the very best high-speed MOSFET solver, it's not for sale. It was developed in-house at Intel, and they wrote that simulator explicitly to be a better simulator than you could buy from anyone at any price. And they wrote it so that they could design better microprocessors than their competitors. That's one of the strategic differences between Intel and AMD. Intel develops their own simulation and CAD tools and AMD buys them. And the consequences of that strategic decision has been played out to the point where there was a while there when people didn't even know that AMD actually still made microprocessors. They just lost the market, okay? Now, here's another example that really underscores the mechanism of the business model. Say you want a simulator that will compute the radar return from a warplane. You can buy software that will do that. There are, for sale, high-frequency finite element solvers that you can use and develop your intuition on how different shape structures reflect radar. But if you want the very best simulator for computing the radar return from a warplane, it's not for sale. The people who wrote that simulator didn't write it so they could sell simulators. They wrote it to sell the planes. And that's the business model under which I wrote LT Spice. 20 years ago, it occurred to me that there were numerical methods that were known that were not used in SPICE simulation programs. That is, I'm saying 20 years ago, it occurred to me that I could write the world's fastest SPICE. I knew how to do it. What do I do with that information? Do I start a software company and try to sell it? Well, that business model has never worked before, and I'd already been writing simulators for 25 years at that point. Uh, so that's not what I did. That's when I joined my neighbor neighborhood semiconductor manufacturer, which at that time was called Linear Technology Corporation. They lived down the road from where I lived. And I wrote LT Spice explicitly to be the world's fastest, most accurate, most numerically spice program available whatsoever. And I wrote it so that Linear Technology Corporation could design better integrated circuits than their competitors. That's why I wrote the, prog the software. LT Spice is used in-house for IC design. 
Now what's unusual about LT Spice is that we give it away. We let you use exactly the same simulator as is used in-house for IC design. And the version that we give you is not crippled in any way. It's not lim limited by node count or circuit size or, or circuit content. Um, it's exactly the same simulator. When you download LT Spice, you go to the same website as our in-house IC designers go. You spin the same disk and you, spin, you get the same file. Now, you can be certain that Analog Devices Corporation does not give LT Spice away out of a charitable interest in the well-being of mankind. Uh, LT Spice is given away because it is in our advantage to do so. It is to our advantage that you have a quality simulator for designing your circuits and, and complement your circuits with our, uh, with our products. That's why we give it away. Now, so this is the situation. This is the, the situation presented to the uh, uh, Spice market. You can buy a Spice program. Or you could get one for free. But the one you get for free, it's faster, more accurate, and more numerically robust. All right? This is an important decision which way we're going to go. Let's really think about this. You can, get a you can get a free Spice program. Or you can pay for one. But if you pay for it, it's not as fast, it's not as accurate, and not as numerically robust. Now, if you give engineers a decade to think about it, they will use the free one, okay? And um, today, LT Spice is, is, over, is, is overwhelmingly the most widely distributed and used Spice program today. Um, LT Spice is used about a thousand times more than all of the other Spice programs combined. You know, we have, it is the industry de facto Spice program. We have literally come to a point in history where if you are doing analog circuit design, but you are not using LT Spice, then you would have to think of an excuse to justify that behavior. Now, I know that's a very strong statement to say about a piece of software I wrote myself, but that's just what's happened. And uh, I'd like to really uh, profusely thank you for listening through that introduction. That's the introduction I give people to LT Spice. And the reason why I give that introduction is because it just bugs me that there are people that think that LT Spice is not as good as the Spice software that you pay for when it is, in fact, the opposite that is the truth. I've, in fact, committed my life to writing this type of software, and I don't see where the software companies have anyone that's done that. Okay, I just don't. So. I just wanted to get that off my chest, and I'm done now. All right, so anyway, during the seminar today, uh, you're, uh, you're free to ask questions at any time. You know, you can interrupt me with questions, and uh, that's actually encouraged, because otherwise I'm gonna stand here doing this monologue all day long, and it's fatiguing. So if you ask a question, it's, it's like a break for me, and I, I appreciate it. So you can ask questions at any time, particularly ask questions if you find me boring. That's an important time to ask questions. Um, and, and we don't have a structured question and answer section because, you know, because I talk all day, it's preposterous to think you would have a question and then wait till the end of the day to ask it. That, that's not what we are as a species, okay? So uh, ask questions at any time, and uh, that's where we're gonna do this. All right, now, I'm always adding, I'm always improving the, the, the numerical methods inside LT Spice. I'm always thinking of new ways and better algorithms to solve the same circuit quicker. But the most visible and obvious changes that you see over the years to LT Spice is that the GUI has uh, evolved. The current version of LT Spice is LT Spice 17. It was released in the, uh, it's called LT Spice 17 because it was released, released in the 17th year of public release, uh, distribution of LT Spice. And the most obvious change between LT Spice 17 and its predecessor, LT Spice 4, is that LT Spice 17 allows you to undock a, uh, a waveform or schematic window from the mainframe of the application, put it on a different monitor and maximize it there. It is completely native multi-monitor. Um, it's also 64-bit, uh, which is of use for, uh, uh, it lets you handle um, wave, uh, very large waveform files um, um, more effectively. LT Spice uh, 4, implemented a 64-bit address space on the disk and would let you page in 
data, you know, up to, up to a few gigabytes of data to the uh, uh, application, but the LTSpice 64 gives you a flat address space throughout the application. And it's Unicode, which means you can use any character of any, any living language, which may not be too interesting to this crowd, but um, uh, it has its use. Basically, you can blame the fact that LTSpice supports Unicode on the Russians. It is their fault. That's a fact. Uh, I, go to, I go to Russia every year, and I've been everywhere in Russia. I've been deep in Siberia, near Mongolia. I've been near Kazakhstan. I've been, um, I've been in uh, uh, Islamic Russia. You know, I've, I've been everywhere in Russia. Uh, last week I was in Russia. You know, I was in Rostov on Don, southern Russia. It's near Georgia, it's where the center of the mafia was in Russia. Anyway, I go everywhere in Russia. And I don't know if you know any Russians, but you can well imagine what their response to LT Spice was. I'd show them this thing, and they'd go, mm. <laughs> That's all very nice. But we want our schematics in Russian. You get that, don't you? Now, that was awkward for me to entertain, because when I simulate the circuit, when I simulate the schematic, I first reduce it to a netlist, get rid of the graphical information, just have electrical connection information. Uh, so I have this netlist, which is a text file, and then I parse the file and store the information and data structures and, and do things and solve the circuit. So uh, a SPICE program is basically a compiler. You know, it, 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 and the netlist is a programming language. It's, it's exactly the same, uh, uh, you use the same software skills as writing a SPICE program as you use for writing a compiler. You figure out how to take an arbitrary big problem and turn it into a bunch of little problems and then use, you know, first laws of physics to solve the thing. It's, it's compiler technology. It's how you write a simulator. Now, every, symbol, every, every single programming language, this netlist is a programming language, and every single programming language is done with Latin characters and English keywords. And even though I actually am a native English speaker, it's not my fault, and you know I've gotten over that. That you know that they that programming languages are in Latin characters and English keywords. So the fact that they wanted Cyrillic was awkward for me to entertain. But you know, after reflection, I realized they were right. It's not too much to have your schematic. So anyway, you can do um, you could have any character of any living language now in LT Spice. And the whole thing is Unicode. See so here you have uh, Hebrew and Japanese and uh, simplified and traditional Chinese, Greek, and of course Hebrew, uh, of course um, uh, Cyrillic. And the whole thing is flat Unicode. You know, you can, uh, every compiler handles uh, uh, Unicode. You can write the uh, expressions with Unicode characters. The whole thing is Unicode. So uh, well, actually, I. What LTSpice supports is every character of every living language. That's actually a subset of Unicode because what I do is the, the bottom 16 bits of Unicode address space. And uh, with that, you can do every character, you know, because there's, there's not that many characters that humanity has to show for itself. I mean, there's 3,000 traditional Chinese, 3,000 simplified Chinese, and then the alphabets. A lot less than, uh, you can easily, it fits in a corner of 16-bit address space. But Unicode is actually just any character. I mean, you could write Klingon, you know, and you'd want to be able to put your schematics in Klingon, but that's not supported. It's just any character of every living language. Anyway, that's, what's a, that's what LT Spice 17 is. Okay, you ready for the demo? Good. Now, when you start LT Spice, the first thing you see is a background picture here, and the point of that background picture is so that you know that that is not a schematic. People would launch LT Spice because the background uh, color of the, of the application, the background color of the schematic, or similar colors that start LT Spice, try to draft a schematic and only get error message or only be ignored. That picture is there so that you know it's not a schematic. That particular picture is um, the Antikythera mechanism. It's the first analog computer about 2,300 years ago from Hellenistic Greece. But you can pick different pictures there. Use your own picture there. All right. Now this thing here gives you, this button gives you a new schematic. Okay? And now you can start um, drafting the schematic on this blank piece of paper. The nature of the demo will be I'm going to design a switch mode power supply. I will use a controller IC that's manufactured by analog devices, and that's what you buy from Alltech. And then I will add a 
um, uh, a MOSFET. I'll, that controller IC will control the power of MOSFET. I'll hook those two together, and I'll add the other parts necessary to build up a switch with power supply. Now, the symbol browser is accessed with F2, and you can um, click on a symbol name, and it will show you a preview of the symbol and give you a description. Um, and I and and as you um, click on these different symbols, you can you can see these um, uh, see what these things look. Like. All right, now. You could alternatively, instead of browsing through the, the pictures with the GUI, you could just type in the first couple of letters and uh, it jump to the symbol you want. That's the way I actually use the symbol browser. That gives me random access to every symbol that's available. I can just type in the first couple of letters and it will jump to that. Now the controller that I want to use is a LTC1624. Um, and the symbol browser can actually spell check after a fashion. I can just type in the number. I can type in one, six, two, four, and spell check that to the 1624, and that's my controller. Now I'm gonna add a MOSFET. I'm gonna add a diode. I'll need an inductor. I will need some resistors. I'll need some capacitors. And I need a voltage source. Okay. Now I'm going to add the electrical connections. All right. Now I actually know that I'm addressing established LT Spice users at this point. And the reason why I know that is because of the sound that I'm hearing in this room as I draft this, these connections. You know, people who have used LT Spice, they've seen automatic wire cleanup, so it's nothing new to them. But what I mean by automatic wire cleanup, I can just draw a wire through a part like that, and it will clean up the wire that I drew through the part. If they haven't used LT Spice before, when they see me do this, you know, I draw the wire through these parts, and I go like this, they go, <sighs> spiritual experience, you know. And anyway, I didn't, I didn't hear that sound, so I actually know I'm a, uh, talking to established LT Spice users. You know what, let's just, let's just have it out. Let's see how much LT Spice expertise we've assembled this morning. Do we have anyone here that's such an expert LT Spice user? They're so good at LT Spice that they should be the one giving this talk. <laughs> Nobody? It, look, it, it's totally cool. It, it, you have no idea how told. You don't have to be shy with me. It's, it's, it's totally all right. All right, well, how many people here use LT Spice? Ah, uh, yes, these are oh, my people. Yes. So do, we have, do we have someone here that's never used LT Spice? Yes! <laughs> I got an opportunity for market penetration. <laughs> you two guys are my best friends today. All righty. Couple more wires to draw. Now, to the best of my knowledge, that's a completely correct schematic of a switch mode power supply. I have not deliberately made any errors when I drafted this thing. If there's a mistake in it, it'll show up when I try to simulate it. But for right now, I would say that is a correct schematic of a switch mode power supply. But despite the fact that it's correct, I cannot simulate this circuit yet because I haven't said what the component values are. I mean, you know, a simulator doesn't symbolically solve your circuit with equations. It numerically solves it for all the specific values you have. So that means I have to say what these component values are. You know, I have to edit these components. Now, even if you're an established LT Spice user, let me point out that there are three ways of editing symbols in LT Spice. There's three different GUIs that you can launch for editing the same symbol. There is an expert mode, and there is an assisted mode. The assisted mode is where the software helps you edit that component, and there is finally the super expert mode. 
and you use the super expert mode when you, when you are absolutely positively certain that you're smarter than the software. Now, as I edit these components, let me call attention to which mode I am using. I'm going to start with expert mode. That's the one you use most of the time. And the nature of expert mode is you point at text, right click, and type in what text you want to see. So here's my little drafting crosshair cursor, and I point at the letter R. And when I point at the letter R, you can see the drafting crosshair cursor turns into a little text caret. That text caret mouse, uh, the fact that mouse cursor turns into a text caret is trying to give you tactical feedback that you are pointing at that letter R. So the idea is you point at text, right click, and type in what text you want. This is the current sense resistor. I'm going to make it 33 milliohm. It's a low value resistance that gives me a fraction of a voltage uh, drop across the resistor for, for a full scale current through the resistor. Using expert mode, let me enter some more component values. Here's the uh, um, voltage divider. This programs the output voltage. This is the output filter cap. This is the load. Uh, it's basically the test vector for my power supply. I'll make that a 3 ohm resistor. Here's the compensation network. All right, now this voltage source it turns out that the simulation that I want to do is a startup transient analysis. That means I want to watch this power supply come up running when I turn it on. I'm a big fan of doing the startup transient analysis of a switchboard power supply, and I'm pretty sure you're going to hear more about startup transient analysis than you expected to hear. I just hope it's not more than you wanted to hear, but anyway. To do a startup transient analysis, I have to turn the power supply on during the simulation. This particular simulation, this particular power supply is turned on by applying input voltage. And that means that this input voltage is not a DC waveform, not a DC value. It is a waveform that starts at zero and then comes up to the input voltage at the very beginning of the simulation. And I will implement that uh, uh, waveform as a piecewise linear source with a single piece in it. It will start at zero, at t equals zero, and a microsecond later, it'll be 12 volt input and stay at 12 volts ever since, ever after. Expert mode, I just typed in the syntax to make that a piecewise linear source. And I could do that in expert mode because I knew the syntax. But that brings us to the second way of editing symbols in LTSpice, assisted mode, where the software helps you edit the component. Now, to enter assisted mode, instead of right-clicking on text, you instead right click on the component body. See, if I bring the mouse cursor, here's a drafting crosshair, and point at the, the component, I get the little hand to give you tactical feedback you are pointing at that component. Right click, and that will launch a GUI to help you edit that type of component. It parsed in already that it knows it's a piecewise linear source, and there'll be a little spreadsheet at RC at t equals zero, zero volts, one microsecond is 12 volts. Okay? That's assisted mode. Right click on the body of the component and a GUI will launch. And it's a different GUI for every single different type of component to help you edit that type of component. And then take this diode. When you put a diode in a simulation, you want to use the right diode model so the forward drop is appropriate, so it has the right capacitance. Now, I could edit that diode in expert mode. I could right click on the value of the diode and type in the name of a diode in my diode model database, and that would be a correct way of editing the diode. But that's clearly ambitious, so let's not do that. Let's instead use assisted mode. You evoke assisted mode by right-clicking on the body of the diode, and that will launch a GUI, which first displays the edit state of the diode. There's this button here called Pick New Diode. When I press the Pick New Diode button, the schematic capture program will read the diode model database and parse it into a GUI. And you can see uh, the actual diode model statements here. And the diode model statements are um, uh, annotated with selection guide information, which is displayed out here. You can see the part number. Basically, what, what assisted mode is doing for you in the case of a diode is it's promoting the problem of editing this letter D from an essay question to multiple choice. That's what it's doing. Now, because the um, diode models are annotated with selection guide information displayed in their own columns, you can sort these dot models according to selection guide information. And I'm going to sort them by current because I know I'm going to want to use a high current diode there. 
in here I've got, um, let's see what I've got here. Okay, here's a seven amp diode that is a Shockey diode. That sounds like what I want to use. Now when I double click on that line, it will uh, edit the, the value of, from D to the name of the model, and because it knows it's a Shockey diode, it will actually use a different symbol for the diode. So when I double click on this, you see the symbol change from a silicon diode symbol to a, a Shockey diode symbol, and there's the uh, name of the diode. That's assisted mode for the diode. Similarly for this MOSFET, it's actually even more important to use the right MOSFET model for a MOSFET than it is to use the right diode model for a diode. And that's because by industry convention, the default behavior of a MOSFET is not a power MOSFET. The default behavior of a MOSFET is a submicroscopic transistor as you would lithograph onto an integrated circuit and it can only switch microamps. It can't switch amps. So uh, if you just put a, a MOSFET in an LTSPICE simulation and try to do a simulation, it'll look like that MOSFET isn't even there. You know, it's look like, it's, it's like there's no more. Anyway, so use assisted mode. Right click on the body of the MOSFET. When you press the pick new diode button, the schematic capture program will read the MOSFET database, parse it into a GUI, and in this case, I'm gonna sort them by MOSFET name because I know which MOSFETs I have in the lab and which one I wanna try. And there's my MOSFET. Okay, so that's assisted mode. You right click on the body of the component and that will launch a GUI and there'll be a different GUI for every single different type of component. Say, take something even as simple as this capacitor. When I edited this capacitor value, I used expert mode. I right clicked on the value and typed in the value of the capacitor. That's the way I did it. But, you know, this other GUI is available. I could have, instead of right clicked on the value, I could have right clicked on the capacitor body and that will launch a GUI that tells me where to enter the capacitance value in case I felt I needed that type of help. But the value of assisted mode for a component as simple as a capacitor is that you can add parasitic impedances. You can add an ESR, an internal inductance, a shunt res leakage, uh, yeah, a shunt resistive leakage and, and capacitance. You can add all these uh, parasitic impedances. Now it turns out that when you're simulating a switch mode power supply, it is imperative that you have an appropriate value of ESR in your output filter capacitor uh, for your output filter capacitor. That output filter capacitor ESR qualitatively impacts the operation of the circuit. And by qualitative, I mean if you have the wrong value of ESR in there, the waveforms that you'll see will look entirely different in an unrelated way. It's that big of a deal. So uh, we need to have the right value of ESR on the output filter cap. Now if we don't know the ESR, of a, um, of a capacitor, there's a database of capacitors and we can select these capacitors. And um, let's just pick some uh, god awful aluminum electrolytic. And here we are, we'll pick this guy. Now you notice that when I pick that capacitor, I'm using a different capacitor symbol. It knows it's a polarized capacitor, so I'm now using the American symbol for a polarized capacitor instead of the American symbol for an unpolarized capacitor. So I can see this is a polarized capacitor, and I see it's 100 microfarad. But when I right-click on the capacitor body, uh, uh, I can see the manufacturer, manufacturer part number, dielectric technology, uh, e, uh, uh, current rating, voltage rating, ESR, all of that information is annotated on that capacitor, but not all of that information is visible on the schematic. And the fact that I've edited something that's invisible on the schematic, that brings us to the third way of editing symbols in LTSPICE, the super expert mode. Okay, all right, now that's how you plot waveform data. And now I wanna get back to uh, this uh, schematic here. I'm gonna label a couple of nets. Uh, this is the output and that's the input. This particular power supply is a, it's called a buck regulator. A buck regulator bucks an unregulated input voltage down to a regulated output. 
And um, uh, I specifically want to look at this um, waveform as I start up. Now I realize, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to look at this uh, output of the power supply during startup. Now I realize that most of you do not spend your day looking at the waveform on the output of a power supply. It's all right, I get it. But where I work, that's what we do. We're all about the waveform and the output of a power supply. So I'm gonna ask you to think along with me as we look at this uh, output, this is power supply output during startup. Now, before, here, you haven't turned the power supply on, so uh, from inspection, you know what the output should be at zero volts, and that's what that is. Now, when you turn the power supply on, what you want to see is you want to see the output come up to the right voltage. That's a big deal. When you make a switch mode power supply, that might not happen. Anything could go I mean, I might have forgotten to use a power MOSFET so you couldn't switch any current through that, it would just never come up. Or I might have miswired this someplace and it wouldn't switch at all, it wouldn't have worked at all, who knows, it might not have started up for, in fact, it might not start up for a subtle reason that would have been missed even in a correct static analysis of the switch mode power supply design. For example, if you use a controller that implements current fold back as an algorithm to prevent the power supply from blowing up in the event of an accidental fault short circuit to ground, well, if your power supply controller uses current fold back so that you don't put full current limit when you have this huge voltage across the power supply, then if your load needs a lot of current, even at low output voltages, it'll never start up. It'll, 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 it'll only trickle a little current in and you'll never overcome the IV curve of the load to charge with the output filter cap. It'll just sit there, latch off and current fold back. Um, but if I see that the power supply can start up into the load, then I'm a pretty happy camper and I figure I can fix any other problem with that power supply. Now the next thing I look for is, is there overshoot? Does the, does the power supply over voltage the load during startup? I mean, I don't want this power supply design or loop compensation to be such that it first takes the output all the way to the input 12 volts and then you know, destroys the load, burns it up, and then some milliseconds later is a good little power supply with a nice stiff five volt rail on it. I don't want it to destroy the load during startup. And then I want to see it powered. And there you see one of the motivations for doing a startup transient analysis. It answers, can it start up into the load? Will it not destroy the load? And will it power the load? So the startup transient analysis you see is the only simulation of a switch mode power supply that you can do that will tell you whether or not your design qualitatively functions at all correctly or not. That's one of the things about startup transient analysis. Now let's talk about how it powers this load. Is that the waveform of DC? It's debatable. If you put a multimeter on it, it'll read five volts. And I mean, unless the multimeter doesn't have good input filtering and this ripple aliases back the DC and gives you the wrong output voltage, if you put a multimeter on that, that's a five volt supply. Your load might qualitatively operate correctly with this. Um, and, and uh, you know, sure, it's got ripple, but you know if you use a switch mode power supply just to improve the efficiency of your power conversion, you're gonna have to live with some ripple on your output. It's inevitable, it cannot be zero. So this thing's got this ripple, and if you wanna reduce, reduce the amount of ripple you see here, the first thing you need to know is whether or not that is switching ripple. If that ripple frequency is at the switching frequency, then if that amount of ripple is objectionable and you need less ripple, then the only thing you can do is buy a better output filter cap. It's really the only thing you can do. There's not that much you can do with the inductor. So um, let's find out if that switching frequency is at the, um, if that ripple frequency is at the switching frequency. So it's, um, there's, the, there's the output voltage. Let me add a plot pane and plot the, uh, to not, uh, to expose the switching frequency of a switch mode power supply, the quickest way of doing that is by looking at the inductor ripple current, because the current will ramp up and ramp down at the switching frequency, and here you can see it ramps up, ramps down. This is the switching frequency. The switching frequency is a much higher frequency than this ripple. 
That means that this ripple is not switching ripple, and that means what is happening is this power supply is oscillating. Now this is actually a very interesting situation because if you were to go build this power supply and look at the waveform on the, on the bench, it would be perfectly stable in practice. It would not oscillate. And this brings up a very, um, a, a topic that a lot of people love to discuss, and that is the difference between simulated waveforms and measured waveforms. People love to talk about this. And um, um, you should be careful, though, you should be aware that much of the discussion pointing out the difference between simulated waveforms and measured waveforms is done out of an agenda that is not in your interest. See, you have to consider how uh, simulation got introduced to analog design. Analog design is much older than analog simulation. And so you got these people that have been designing analog circuits for a long time, people my age that were designing circuits since the 70s or even earlier, and then someone writes a simulator. Well, consider how an established analog designer would feel about the existence of simulators. It suggests that somebody fresh out of university could design a better circuit than I can, and I've been doing it since, since when, okay? So, you know, the horror. Now, one way to save the situation, save the day, would be to discount simulation as a design technique, to, you know, to, to say that the simulation doesn't have value. And one way to suggest that L, uh, simulation has no value would be to point out that simulated waveforms and measured waveforms don't agree. If they don't agree, what are you doing with the simulator, right? So um, that's an agenda that is not in your interest. Now let me tell you the trick. You see, there's a trick to getting simulated waveforms and measured waveforms to agree. It's an important trick. You need to know what it is. What you need to do is build what you simulated. That's how that works. If you build exactly what you simulated, the waveforms will agree. There's really uh, no, uh, no room to deviate from that situation. What's possible is you can write a simulator. It's basically compiler technology that reduces some arbitrary large problem down to a bunch of uh, smaller you know, first principles and solves the thing and apply it. I mean, it's, it's a similar sort of situation as a, as a C compiler. I mean, if you have a program, if it has a bug, you don't complain about the compiler. The program is, the bug is in the, in the program. That's just the way technology works. It's the way technology is. So if you build what you, sim if you build what you simulated, they will agree. That's what will happen. What is not possible is for you to rearrange a few surface mount components that violates Kirchhoff's law. That's off of the table, okay? Build what you simulated, they'll agree. Now, it turns out you can't build this circuit. It's impossible. The thing is, if you build this circuit, you will use an output filter cap that has ESR, and that ESR will put a zero in the loop response and make it stable. Now, let's talk about the ESR of output filter caps. Let's start with lumen electrolytics. The ESR of an aluminum electrolytic output filter capacitor is measured in ohm. Might be half an ohm, might be an ohm, might be 1.8 ohm, it's ohm. But there are very fancy aluminum electrolytic output filter capacitors that you can buy that are especially made to sit on the output of a switch mode power supply and they have very low ESRs. You can buy an aluminum electrolytic capacitor with as little output ESR as say 20 milliohms. That exists, but that is a carefully procured aluminum electrolytic capacitor. That is not the aluminum electrolytic capacitor in your grandmother's radio. And you put that 20 milliohms there, you see it's perfectly stable. And up until 20 years ago, that was the mode of operation of every switch mode power supply. The output filter capacitor ESR, if it didn't complete the stability of the feedback loop, it improved its phase margin. And uh, so you see there's an advantage to having the ESR on the output filter cap. It makes the thing stable, improves the phase margin, it, and because it increases the phase margin, this thing will actually regulate voltage better with ESR. Under a transient load response, if there is an abrupt change in load current, 
when the feedback loop uh, uh, resettles, it will ring less when it resettles, and, or, you know, so it'll, it'll regulate voltage better with ESR. That's a frequency domain point of view of the description, but it's worth understanding the way it works in the time domain. If there's an abrupt change of current in the load, that abrupt change of current is gonna flow through the capacitor. It won't flow through the inductor, it won't, flew this, it won't go through this you know, 35 kilo ohm resistor. It's gonna, that current's gonna come from that capacitor. When it flows through that ESR, it will make an instantaneous voltage change in the output. And that instantaneous voltage change goes into the feedback pin, goes into the air amplifier, and the air amplifier can immediately start correcting the feedback loop. That's if you do have ESR. If you don't have ESR, that instantaneous load current still flows through this capacitor, but if there's no ESR, there's no change in voltage there. There's, you know, to change the voltage across the capacitor, you have to draw current for a while to change the voltage across the capacitor. And that means later you will get a voltage change in the air amplifier can only start correcting the feedback loop later, and that's why it rings. So that's the time domain description of why ESR improves the um, uh, 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 voltage regulation of a switchboard power supply. But that ESR has some disadvantages. For one, the inductor ripple current will be read out by a, to a voltage by the ESR in the output filter capacitor. See, if you look at this output ripple here, this ripple, the amplitude of this ripple is due to the inductor ripple current flowing through the ESR of the output filter capacitor. See, you're, and, and the normal operation of a switch mode power supply is to have an output clock ripple proportional to the ESR of the output filter capacitor, not inversely proportional to the output filter capacitor capacitance. So that reads out the inductor ripple current to a voltage. So you have the EMI performance of the controller isn't as good if you have ESR in the output filter cap. And there's another disadvantage of the, um, of the ESR of your output filter capacitor. Because the entire inductor ripple current flows through that ESR, and that ESR is a real impedance, you're dissipating power. And that decreases the efficiency of the switch mode power supply. Now that's not some little academic nit. That is a huge impact on the efficiency of your converter. These days, it is easier to buy a one milliohm MOSFET than it is to buy a one milliohm capacitor. Now, this particular controller doesn't use synchronous rectification, but if both switches are MOSFETs, the output filter capacitor is, the, is easily the dominant loss in your switcher, okay? Um, the, um, uh, Another problem with the ESR of your output filter cap is because you're, you, know, you lose efficiency if it has ESR, and because you're losing efficiency, you're generating heat, and that heat goes into heating up your output filter capacitor, aluminum electrolytic, and that shortens its life. And that can be a, you know, a disaster. But you know that switch mode power supplies are designed with aluminum electrolytic output filter capacitors with alarming regularity and success. This is a manageable problem. You know, this is why electrical engineers get paid more than taxi cab drivers, right? I mean, because you, know, you, will, you will probably be the final technical authority for the ESR of your output filter capacitors in your business unit. Okay, this is gonna be your responsibility. And you're gonna to have to learn how much uh, ESR is appropriate to have in your power supply, and you're gonna to have to learn how to procure uh, the right uh, capacitor that does that. You're gonna to have to set that up, and then you're gonna to have to uh, police your purchasing agent for the entire time that that power supply is in production. You know, because if, if the person, you know, say, say some cap vendor takes your purchasing agent out to lunch and sells them some cheap caps, and he looks great, then your power supply fails. That's your fault. And everybody's gonna know it's your fault because you're the one that's gonna have to fix it, okay? So, you know, that's what you're gonna have to do and that's why engineers get paid so much money. Now, what LT Spice can do for you is it can help you uh, manage the situation. You know, with simulation, you can find out how much ESR you need, how much you can tolerate. There's a database of capacitors. It's gonna help you with that. In fact, because it's a general purpose circuit simulator, you could try circuit design techniques for dealing with that output filter capacitor. You could put capacitors in parallel, you know. In fact, you can even put different types of capacitors in parallel with uh, different dielectrics 
and make a, um, uh, a cocktail of um, a, a capacitor, a capacitor with a cocktail of uh, dielectrics that gives you the um, overall performance you need. Now, let's try that. Let's try putting a ceramic capacitor in parallel with the aluminum electrolytic. And the, um, the ceramic capacitor has ESR. It's got milliohms of ESR, but I'm going to ignore that for now. And um, um, uh, the idea to the ceramic capacitor is I will smooth out these sharp corners here on this waveform and improve the EMI performance of the switcher. That's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to take this approach immediately to the logical extreme. I'm going to use a huge ceramic capacitor in parallel with the aluminum electrolytic because I don't want to just smooth out these sharp corners. I actually want the entire, I actually want the inductor ripple current to flow through the ceramic capacitor. So the ripple current doesn't flow through the aluminum electrolytic capacitor with its ESR so it doesn't dissipate power. I want my efficiency back and I'll improve EMI. So by huge, I'm really not joking. I'm going to take this approach immediately to the logical extreme and I'm going to use 50 microfarads of ceramic capacitance. But I will leave the lumen electrolytic in the circuit because that at the much lower feedback loop crossover frequency, the ESR of the lumen electrolytic will still contribute to defining the impedance of this node and it will still get my zero. Let's see how that works. You could do that. No sharp corners. Ripple current flowing through the um, uh, ceramic cap, that approach would work. The only problem with this is if someone is looking over at your shoulder at this design, they're going to wonder why this capacitor is still there. Because the point of your output filter cap is it gives you this bulk capacitance to supply charge as necessary for abrupt changes in step load current that can't come out of the, uh, can't come from the power supply itself because this can't go through the current. All right, so you already have almost enough bulk capacitance to take care of that. Why not just use all ceramic capacitance if you're going to go there? Uh, and that way you don't have to buy, you don't have to, uh, 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 that will make the thing as quiet as possible, as efficient as possible, and you won't even have to spend time learning how to buy aluminum electrolytic capacitors. If you do that, this power supply will be perfect, you know, except for the fact it doesn't work because it oscillates, but other than that, it's perfect. Well, Ultispice can help you with this also, because notice that a current mode controller has two capacitors that um, uh, control the feedback loop, the open loop transfer function of the feedback loop. One is the output filter capacitor, that is the dominant pole, and the other is this compensation capacitor here. This is connected to the output of the error amplifier. Let's use a bigger comp cap. Let's comp it down. And you could see that, that, could, that you could use that technique to make it stable. But before we go um, run off to production with this circuit, we, what we should really do is search our heart and ask ourselves if that is the behavior of a stable circuit. Well, you know, the answer to the question of whether or not this is a stable circuit depends entirely on who is asking the question. If you're in a university environment and your professor puts this waveform on your final exam and asks you, is that the waveform of a stable circuit, there is only one answer that will earn you full credit. And that is to report that since this ringing is decaying exponentially with time, the feedback loop has phase margin. So low, the circuit is stable. That's the only answer in a university that's going to get you through with, with full honors. Now in a commercial environment, that's the wrong answer. Okay, this is not a stable circuit. Yes, this particular unit, the, the ringing decays away, but you know, for all you know across production scatter, you might have units where the ringing exponentially increases with time, and even if you don't have that situation, there isn't one unit that's gonna have good transient response. This is not a stable circuit. If you make this circuit and sell it to somebody, you're a bad boy, okay? 
But again, this is a manageable problem. Many switch mode power supplies have a schematic that look exactly like this up to these two capacitance values. And you can use LT splice to trade between loop crossover frequency and stability in a manner appropriate to the commercial context that that thing is going to be used in. You can do this. Or you could have an epiphany. And the particular item of epiphanence that I am looking for is a feedforward capacitor. A feedforward capacitor is a capacitance connected between the output and the feedback pin. It's a low value capacitor that affects the differentiator against the impedance of the voltage divider. It, its job is to advance the phase of frequencies around crossover, improve the phase margin, and make the thing more stable. And that's what we're looking for. That's a feedback loop that's got everything going on, except that feedback loop has no personality. If it's sitting in regulation and you kick it, all it does is race back to regulation with no overshoot. That's the sort of power supply that works when it's made wrong, continues to work after it's broken.